Gloss allows us to see in and out and invites us to imagine. Imagine Museum Contemporary Glass Art. Hello, I'm Jane Buckman, Executive Director of Imagine Museum, and welcome to another episode of I Am Exchange. Today, we are going to have a very informative conversation with American artist Dan Clayman. We are fortunate to have some important works of Dan's in our collection, of which you'll become more familiar with as we move forward in our conversation. So welcome, Dan. <laughs> Thanks so much for taking the time to join us today and sharing your insights about your inspirations, your processes, and what you're currently working on in the studio. Hello. Hi, Dan. Hello. Hi. Hello. Can you hear me fine? I can hear you fine. Done. Okay, good. So um, I just want to thank you up front for taking the time to put together this presentation and sharing your insights with us. And uh, but let's get let's just get started because I know there's so much material that I'd like to cover with you. So um, as I said, you really prepared a fabulous group of images to share with our audience and. Uh, I would like for you to begin with giving us some background uh, about your influences and, and what impacted your decisions to choose a creative life in the arts. So uh, take it away with some of those slides uh, from the beginning. Okay, so you can see this fine? Yes? Not, not yet, but soon enough. Oh, I see, okay. Uh, how about that? Nothing. Nope, I've got okay. it now. You do Looks have it? Looks great. Okay. I, we do have it. Looks great. Okay. Um, good afternoon on the East Coast and everybody else. And for those of you in Florida, I hope you're Florida and the Carolinas. I hope you're recovering and uh, that looked pretty horrible. Um, yes. So I hope you're okay. And um, Jane and the Imagine Museum, thanks for asking me. Um, I'm certainly an artist under in change right now, and you'll you'll kind of see what's going on here. So let me just start out for those of you who may not. Let's see. I'm trying. Okay. Uh, this is my studio, and it's just part of the studio. And we're going to look at the studio later because I have a project I've been working on, on and off for four years that I finally over the weekend got up to look at in a scale model. So I'm gonna take you out into the studio in a little bit. Um, introduction, and I know most of you who are here know who I am, but my father and mother on the left and my siblings minus one, he wasn't at the picnic down below them. And then my current family on vacation at the JFK Museum in Massachusetts in Hyannis if you're ever there, it's a very interesting museum. And um, Mia and Audrey, the two dogs in the backyard. So, <laughs> so we have adorable. A, yeah, we have a full life. Um, my father was a manufacturer of shoes post World War II, um, and my mother was uh, an art artist, art connoisseur, uh, not a collector, but somebody. Somebody who is engaged all the time. Okay. I'm getting some feedback here. You were, but it's gone now. Okay, good. All right. So um my father spent um oh geez, I think three years in the South Pacific. And um <clears throat> he went to uh on a I'm showing this because I just want to show you a little funny way that I think. So <laughs> I inherited his scrapbook. And on the lower left is his guest card from the Hotel Auckland. And um, he was getting treated for malaria for a month or so, and then had two weeks leave and then and went to this um, hotel. And when I went to New Zealand, I did some research at the public library and found the building 
And on the lower right was the only way we could find it. It's called a searchable PDF. So you couldn't enter Hotel Auckland, but you could scan it and highlight it. So I had a great librarian and I fear that I might have, yeah, I left the next slide out, um, which was a picture of a building of the old Hotel Auckland, which is now a office building, an office building. But what interested me about it was to be somewhere where he was all those years ago. Yeah. And yeah. to possibly even, there was a molecule of my father still floating around or something. Yes, yes. So I, how, I'm, yes. How Jay. old were you, how old were you when you made that journey? Just and you, three years ago. Oh, fantastic. Yep, just three yeah. years ago, mm -hmm. I was speaking at a conference and spent some days on either end. Um, anyway, uh, I think this was an incredibly formative time, obviously, of his life. But the way I grew up with him was him as a manufacturer. So you see, mm -hmm. I, I love to make things and um, mm -hmm. he had a factory and um, and then this piece, which I will talk about a little bit more um, yeah. in landscape, really speaks to that moment in New Zealand for me just feeling the light of the day. In here, I've taken the built environment and brought my idea of a nostalgic piece of light in. Hmm. In New Zealand, I was standing on a street corner um, with the nostalgic light. Noon on February 23rd on a sunny day, the light's going to look pretty much the same in 1945 and nine, uh, 2019. Oh, well, interesting. Wow. So, okay. I was a theater guy and I was hooked on theater from the time I saw Mary Martin as Peter Pan at the Wilbur Theater. Um, and it's very much informs all the work that I do still. My introduction to glass was through my father's Stuben yearly Stuben gifts to my mother. <laughs> and uh, this was a big anniversary, um, 25th anniversary the Stuben teardrop candlesticks. Wow. And my first love of theater really kind of took off and really began to happen. And through the late seventies and early eighties, this is what I did. So this is, if you look at the top, you might notice it's, it's uh, rock and roll popular music. Mm -hmm. um, and so these are some bands that I toured with and so I was like, what, I was 21 years old, 22 years old, uh, running around the country and, oh, this is great. I love this. And then the serious stuff was at the bottom, modern dance, opera and straight theater. Mm -hmm. So what fascinated you about theater? What that made that your first foray into the arts? What was it about theater? And you were setting lights, correct? Is that so? You were more of a tech. Mm -hmm. I was. I was a lighting designer, a stage manager. Mm -hmm. A lot of lighting designers are also technical directors, but um, I was a lighting designer, stage oh. manager. And what uh, fascinated me as I got into my teens, and I was the theater geek at high school, and I had jobs with small lighting companies in the summer. It's a great question, Jane. What I loved was the first time you put the lights on every day. Like the first new, the first time you see a new light plot light up. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it was, it, that was the thing. And I love the community, love the cooperation and very much the glass scene nowadays, especially I'll talk a little bit about that. Very collaborative. Um, but I left because I couldn't see living a life where I was on the road all the time. I, before pandemic, I was on the road a lot for my theater, by my uh, glass work. But um, back in the 70s and 80s, I was on the road all the time. And I just couldn't see creating a family. And, and but that's, we'll get into it in one quick second. Sure. So in Keep going. Mm -hmm. In 1980, this is me backstage in Albany, New York. <laughs> and barely a year and a half later, this is me at Penland. 
So same hairy guy, but <laughs> with a, a mindset that's completely shifted. And I had not a clue what was going on. This is the first piece I ever did with glass, the flame bucket. The note from the director was, I want to open up the second act of Cyrano with the soldiers warming their hands. I want the lights to come up. And before the lights come up, I want the fire pot to first come up. And um, so I didn't know anything about glass, but I figured you probably could. I didn't even know the word slump. But I had a friend with a kiln. I got some regular plate glass and slumped it over some bricks, painted it black and red and yellow, and put a light bulb under it. And so anything that's electric, whether it's a prop or not, uh, falls under lighting. If it's a light or something that requires electricity falls under lighting. So I made, made this for that. And that is my one thing that's funny for any of you glass uh, technical people is you can bring a piece of uh, regular strength plate glass up to a thousand degrees from room temperature in like an hour probably safely all right let's say two hours i took like a day and <laughs> when i say a day overnight and there were no computers i was every hour with the controller <laughs> um but it worked and then this is as i was leaving so i I kind of made this transition and um, applied to RISD as a 27 year old sophomore in 1983-ish mm -hmm. and was interested in blowing. I'd worked for a bunch of production people. Um, Josh Simpson just had his 50th anniversary working with glass, which surprised right. me because it just means I'm not that far behind. Um, <laughs> so this- this was the blown work I was making. And this was 1980s at RISD. James Carpenter, Jamie Carpenter had gone to Vanini and there was this whole thing about the Saturn ring. And it, at some point people called it the RISD ring. But I had an amazing education at RISD and the RISD glass program, the best thing they did, which is what I endeavored to do when I was a teacher, when I'm a teacher, was a great visiting artist series. And I just sure. encourage anybody that's in a position to help these, a lot of the small programs bring in visiting artists, whether it be on Zoom or physically, uh, it's a really good and inexpensive thing to, the students, I think the students get the most out of visiting artists mm -hmm. more than anything else. So this is the work I was making. Uh, the theme here is nostalgia. Hmm. So hmm. that was as I was leaving leaving art school. This is I, I I just wanted to keep this kind of trimmed down, but this is one of the pieces from my BFA thesis show. Because wow. it had taken me so long to get through college. It took me eight colleges <laughs> and nine years, <laughs> 10 years to get through college. Um it it was really I, I arrived at RISD right at the right time in my, as I guess. So well, James. Seeing, seeing the, uh, the artists in residence that you were exposed to, you had, uh, again, for your direction and the people that you saw, I think that that's uh, pretty impressive. What I'm going to say is that I do see Trish Duggan on our Zoom, and I'm going to invite you, Trish, to at the bottom of your screen on the left-hand side, there is a mute button and you can unmute yourself just by pressing that button. If I were there, I'd help you. <laughs> it's on your computer screen at the bottom left. And if somebody can help you find that, then you can get un unmuted. We can't do it from this side. You have to do it. I'll have, uh, we'll have somebody help you, Trish. I'll, I'll get somebody to help you. Okay. Um, Dan, I want you to go ahead because I know Trish wants to uh, be part of this also to enjoy your work, see what's happening with you. But let's move on to uh, the objects because I do want to say I was able to preview all of the your PowerPoint and just seeing your your last your, your career actually through slides was uh, quite impressive to me. 
And what always has impressed me about the works and even the works that we have here in the museum is the precision of the forms that you create, but also how they respond to light and then how they also command attention in the environment. So as you go through and you talk about these objects that you put together, I just want to hear about your evolution in, in this creative process of um, going from objects on pedestals to the environments that you create today. So uh, take it away. But that's, that's, it's really fascinating to see all of this work together. Um, so this is the place to start. This is post art school, so 1986. Um, and I got a studio right out of school and made this type of work for another year. And this is um, from a series called Handled Objects. And okay. um, I'm just trying to think here how to phrase this. So Handled Objects was a nostalgic look at pocketbooks, hand iron, like ironing irons. Um, and I, I, it's so funny to say this because it's so long ago, but my mother was uh, the mother of six of us with my father always at work. And boy, did she thought a kid with a well-pressed shirt meant a happy kid. And so this was my first show of work that was getting getting personal and I'm, I'm, but I'm trying to figure out the material and really bit my teeth into casting. And this type of casting in the early eighties, mid eighties was, um, oh, I'm getting that again. I think Trisha's unmuted. Yeah, she just has to get rid of her sound. Okay. Um, so these handled objects. Oh, I think we did it. She's gonna get somebody to help her, yeah. Okay. So the handled objects, while they are very much formal objects, start and, and you can see there is a sense of considered design. They were very much, yeah. um, autobiographical for where my life was then. Hmm. Uh, How so? Well, it, well, first of all, my mother passed on during this time and I had my first okay. show. Remember the glass gallery in Bethesda, Maryland? Sally, okay. Sally and Ned Hansen. Sally Hansen, I think was her name. So I had a show and my first show was of handled objects. And during getting ready for that show, um, my mother died of heart of heart issues. So that's like 1988. And, um, but this body of work is what I first brought to Doug Heller. And Doug Heller in um, June of 88, June of 89 said, you can have a show in September or you have to wait two years. So I made a group of these objects in three months um, over that summer, all the while while my wife was pregnant with our twins. So oh. <laughs> it, it was quite, quite a time. Yeah, yes. Um, and so I'm not showing you a lot of each. I'm just going to try to do a broad thing. Um, yeah. this, this is called Osterone. It's based on a pelvic bone. So Osterone for bone. Um, and for me, this is one of my favorite pieces that I've ever made. It, it could be a ladle. It obviously refers to something about the pelvic girdle and, and the spine. But for me, the shape and the tension of just sitting on its uh, tip is sublime. Yeah. For me, yeah. I'm not saying it is sublime in the world, but for me, it was very satisfying. Yeah. Um, and this is a piece called kirogris. Kiro, which is a Greek word for tool. And I took the traditional um, uh, textile shuttle loom and made it on the left in uh, graphite, in the middle glass, and on the right bronze. So, um, and, and the glass, I did not cast that. I carved that out of a piece of glass. 
which was um, I was very impressed when I got to the end and the and the needle up the middle didn't hadn't fallen off. Yeah. But I'm really, <laughs> I'm I'm really looking at this time at things that you would use to do stuff. Mm -hmm. so handled objects, a Greek word for object. Um, and by the mid '90s, I was. I think the easiest way to explain this is I was somehow working on a theme of protection and, yeah. um, and material difference to bronze and glass. So this is one of those pieces. It's about 16 inches stem to stern. And I was very invest, so invested in um, pedestal work, uh, objects that I could keep contained and see into this, this type of scale. And we do have this piece at the museum or part of it and this one as well. Um, this is called meniscus. And um, so I so I'm working along on these pieces. And one day I'm just pulling with a cup of liquid. And I was just kind of fooling around with how making a meniscus and you know, you put one drop too much and it spills over the bottom. I mean, it yeah. spills over the lip. The lip. Mm -hmm. So I just had this idea to make meniscus. And you'd think that the pool of glass of liquid could have been, to show that, should have been up at the top. But no, it's got that spout that would cause the meniscus to form at that level, yeah. not at the top of the lip. I do so, like that. I, I haven't heard that and we do have that. We had it displayed in the museum and I never knew quite how to describe it to others, but uh, that really makes sense now to me. Thank you. I, I would say that it's an outlier to that body of work of bronze and glass because what's different is it's got this uh, steel with um, graphite stand on it. And formally that changes the language immediately. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And then yes, everything envelops. Yeah. Yep. And so here we're now into the 2000s. This piece is called Ben. And it's really just a quick moment to fake you out. Was this, did he bend this material to hold it up there? So it's just a visual illusion. I'm not expecting anybody to think that that would bend and unbend. Um, <laughs> but it's about the negative space. Love it. And um, these are pieces that I called lanterns. I was making those from thir 2013 till a couple of years ago. Um, the blue piece on the right is still in the studio. I've kind of retained it. It's a, it's, for me, it's a great version of this. And it was really um, generated by being friends with Michael Glancy, who passed away last yeah. two summers ago. Uh, he taught me this electroplating um, and very much like the handled objects. It was kind of a move back 20 years, but with an impetus of, um, I follow all these mountain, I don't, I'm not a mountain climber, but I'm fascinated by those who go to Everest and on the paths up to Everest through all those villages, there are these stupas and these are based loosely <laughs> off of those as a design exercise. So light and the work, yes. this is gonna lead us to where we, to, to the um, pieces at the Imagine Museum. Mm -hmm. This is just a great image of light doesn't show itself till it's reflecting on something. So my friend Allison sent this to me one day some years ago, and this is just dust. She, she was clean in the house and this is dust being lit. Otherwise that stream of light would only show on the floor. So through the early 2000s, um, really up to probably for like seven to 10 years, I worked on these spires and skins of light. So on the right, it's solid. It's a solid spire, what I call the spire of light. So I work that way for, a, actually, you know what? Now that I'm thinking of it, I first was making the skins. And what I wanted to do was take that aesthetic 
of the large scale castings like the Lubinskys, like Howard Ben Trey. Mm -hmm. um, and I had looked at that work all through my formative years and I wanted to approach that scale without the mass. And that's, excuse me, how that started. Wow. Um, and so the one on the left is only an inch thick at the back and a half an inch thick at the front. So it's, um, um, they, it was a very difficult exercise and I, I just worked at it. I think it was three years from idea to the first time we could show the first one. Wow. And I got through looking at that as, as, oh, these kind of are like light, light beams. And so on the right, a few years later, I began to make it <laughs> solid. And you can see how the melt looks so different, especially the, um, on the right of the <laughs> casting, on the right casting, you can see that clearish glass, which is only looking like that because it's thin. And that's how one of these pieces look in that looks in natural light out the back door of the studio. Beautiful. So I'm really thinking about light, thinking about my time as a lighting designer, thinking about why we use smoke in rock and roll lighting. It's not <clears throat> only because it looks great to see Kiss walking through a stage <laughs> of smoke. It's interesting because it describes the path of light. And so you have a Rolling Stones tour of 1981 where they hung over 500 lights in the air every night. It's really amazing what the patterns in space can be and not, you know, not just um, the lighting on the performers. And this is just a process shot of the size of molds to make those pieces. Um, and there was, I, I worked in a, my studio from like 1992, 1990, had one to, one to three employees. As I hit 2000, <clears throat> I was doing all this big mold making work and I, I had like eight employees every day. And I grew, I loved them, but I hated having employees. I, I felt <laughs> like I, I was losing my way as an artist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, so 2013, 2012, I've trimmed it back down and really am here most of the time alone, but have part-time people as needed. Um, in 2007, I did a show at the Mint Museum and I showed circular object number one, which was made in 2004. And it was inspired by a, pro, uh, a poem called Empty Volume um, by by um, Israel's poet laureate, Yehuda Amichai. And he wrote this beautiful poem called Open, Closed, Open, where um, he described that before you're born, everything is open with possibility. When you come into the life, everything's still possible, but all of a sudden it's circumscribed in a circle of, of your life. Mm -hmm. And when you die, um, everything opens up again for the next thing to begin. And he wrote about the Holocaust for years. He died probably eight years ago. Um, but it got me to thinking about the, not only the object itself, but the negative space that, that the object alerts you to. So all of a sudden that circle, that void inside the structure of the circle, you would never have noticed it there had we not given you a structure to look at. That's right. That's so right. Um, pierced volume uh, is six feet. It's, on, it's in the museum, uh, the Hunter Museum in Chattanooga. And um, it, it is based on architecture. It's also got the same proportions as a typical styrofoam cup, because that's what I was using as the study model for the meetings with the curator at the Mint Museum. Um, <laughs> And that's assembled with 500 parts. Um, wow. And here's two more pieces from that show, White Light. The, um, the one on the right is called Leaning Plane and it is purposely, it's 10 and a half feet tall 
And it's purposely made to spook you out a little with the material that this is. So it's leaning off of plum, probably 15 degrees towards you. Love uh, it. And that's made of however many individual uh, glass blocks. So somebody might say he's gluing this together. That's crazy. When you glue properly, the glass is stronger than the glue itself. Um, I mean, the glue, the glue joint is stronger than all of those glue joints make a matrix stronger than one piece of glass would be. And in this way, what I could do is make each block, each block had a hollow center with white skin. So when you light this thing up, you can really see this light transmitting through. And you can, without me describing it exactly, if you look at it, you can see all the color density. If you look at the second row from the top, the top, the set, all the way to the right, you can see that the light is shining through there some more. And here's some other pieces. Um, aperture on the right, is simply, I went through all this effort to make a device that would project the light. So I probably could have done it some way different, but I wanted it to be this oddball um, projector. So that work led to these architectural pieces. So this is a nine feet tall. It's, uh, it's called tall sliced volume. And the reason it's called tall sliced volume is there was one sliced volume and it looked too stumpy, it was too low. So I built it up more. Um, and again, it, it refers to the castle work, that one image I showed of the castle pieces. It refers, refers to structure, but it also really gives you a great clue as to what this material um, can do. Mm -hmm. And um, there's some of the pieces we've talked about in my show at the um, Muskegon Museum of Art. And it was a show of objects that took perhaps different routes um, to their making. And for instance, the blue circular object, which is at the museum. Right. Why is that an outlier? Because everything else had been made in really muted colors. And that became an outlier to what I was doing. Um, and I liked it a lot when I made it, but I was you know, probably one day fiddling around in the studio and said, oh yeah, 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 let's let's get that a little, um, uh, let's make a color shift. And so what's with the circle? I persist with the circle, you'll see. There can't be anything more satisfying making than a circle. And really what it's about is it um, refers in so many cultures to the life cycle. And there's parts of me that could work on these circles every day, all day. And when we go into the studio to see the latest piece that's um, come to fruition, um, we'll stop at the circle table and you can see some of the molds. So project, you know, yes. Yeah, and what I, I do wanna say, and as we move on to your projects and your environmental projects, that from the work that started and so this is how I view it. And as we move forward in the projects that it seems in the beginning of your career, you had these pieces that were enveloping uh, light and, and it's somewhat as you were describing in this um, protective kind of uh, uh, idea. And as you move forward then, and I see it in the objects that we have in the gallery, that then your, your works opened up. They, 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 they became open and they became more to command the space around them. Instead of capturing the space, except your circles, you know, you have that negative space, but it's still open. So I find the, what you've been doing, and it's the relationship to this lighting that you did earlier in your career. It's kind of you're you're creating the stage, and you're creating the the light on the on the stage now with these larger projects. So move forward with that because I I find it this was the evolution, and then now you're you, you have arrived. Yeah, um, 
And I, I think that um, that's a good observation because part of scaling up is opening up. Yes. Um, you can actually, for instance, um, you can walk through this circle. This is at Swan Point Cemetery and in Providence. And the assignment from the cemetery was make a place of contemplation in our new columbarium, um, mm. uh, which is a mausoleum, but with wall spaces in it. That's what differentiates it. Um, no, what differentiates it, a columbarium has both ashes and places for your beloved's um, remains, body, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So this piece, my closest competitor on this was a art, an artist who wanted to do a bronze angel holding a baby. So there were two of us as finalists and um, I just, I said, I, you know, I got to take a chance here. And I came up with this symbol and I, I felt like I, I, I hit, the, hit the nail in the head. And a lot of this stuff that I'm talking about, if you go to my website, danielclayman.com, you can look up videos and mm -hmm. you'll see a, a more in depth. Um, this piece is called Suspended Shadows and the assignment was, I need something, I, I want an intervention in my house that's not gonna be suspected. So I use the mm. light coming into this house as the beginning part of this. So the objects, I think, no, the objects, um, they're large, they're eight feet and seven feet respectively, and they're quite heavy, but I thought it was really courageous of the client to say, we are gonna keep our couch underneath this. And you know, I, I still speak to the guy every once in a while. He says, people still stand on, sit under there and go, oh. But so there's a certain amount of purpose. Are those suspended from the ceiling? They're suspended. Those, wow. Yep. Oh, yep. Nice. And, um, you know, engineering is a real joyful part of all this. And so mm -hmm. for instance, you would not use Home Depot hardware bolts for the bracket <laughs> up in, well, you could, and it'd probably be fine, but these are aircraft grade bolts. These are the yeah. things that the minutia that I can be interested in. Yeah. This was um, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee. And the assignment there was we need a place where periodically we can gather the employees for celebrations and um, and they had seen the circle, a smaller circle somewhere. Um, so that's that. And here's, oh, so we're back to the Allison's uh, stream of light. And I wanted to make a captured light, but not in glass. So I didn't have to worry about the technology. So this is 2006 at the Fuller Museum of Art in um, Massachusetts which gave way to this work that I'm still very invested in. So this was um, at Brown University. I was, the intervention there was give me something great in this gallery for 250th graduation weekend. And this is what I came up with. So this talks about the nostalgia of light. It talks to that Proustian idea of sensory so that if you walk into somebody's apartment that has this chicken soup simmering, similar to your mother's, you'll think of your mother. But if you walk in here on a day that's something outside on a winter day, this still captured this same light in the gallery. Um, and finally, I was, I'm really, I, I love the color field painters. So this gave me, that way of taking the saturated light and instead of with pigment, make that right-hand wall happen. It's a stunning piece. Is it still up? So is that a permanent that installation? Up, that was up for eight weeks. Wow, where is that now? I'll get to that. Yeah. Um, I'll get to that because it is somewhere. It's good, it's a beautiful uh, piece. It's kind of somewhere. Um, okay. <laughs> in 2016, Mass College of Art, I was teaching there and I gave a lecture and the gallery director of the school heard one little nugget about something I was thinking about and came to me and said, I want your, your, a piece of yours 
to open our new media design center. So this is the building they built. And this is what I was proposing. So I had this idea, literally walking on a street in Providence, getting wet from the rain. And I just, I came up with this word, a word rainfield. And um, it's not probably an original way of saying it, but it's what the piece became. And this was <clears throat> another rendering because I was bringing Gothic architecture into it. This is my student group making 12,000 raindrops. Oh my. <laughs> and here it is, Rainfield at Mass College of Art, where I'm taking pixelated pixels, as is a raindrop is a pixel, and creating an architectural detail. And this doesn't look like a Gothic arch. This looks like a Roman barrel arch, which it is because two days before installation started, uh, the fashion department said, you can't come so low to the floor with your Gothic arch because it will inhibit what we're doing for fashion show months from now. So I had to redo it because the proportion had to be the same. It's all good. It's all good. I love it. So Not here's nice. another viewpoint. So that was up for two and a half years. Wow. And um, I'll show you what's happening now. But okay. radiant landscape. So this is where that piece from Brown ended up. This is the way I saw the gallery the day I was offered the show. And these are the computer models, the renderings. And here's the piece. So in one end of the gallery was radiant landscape. And now I don't not only have the amber, but it's shining on that clear glass, which um, makes the light, it adds a dimension to it as a lens. Mm -hmm. And then on the other end of the gallery was blue horizon. And if anything, this refers to Eve Klein's blue paintings where it's just saturated. Um, so, and here's the curator and I after dinner one night looking into the building. Wow. So an ongoing project is the landscape project. I was given a residency at Tyler School of Art and I endeavored to make a boulder, re-inhabit re a boulder, reform a boulder in, into glass and here I am at this boulder farm, a landscape place. So they loaded a boulder on my truck and we divided the boulder up into 500 something parts and made all these molds and everything was cataloged. And um, we developed a system for knowing where everything went. And this is the day that Kobe and I are putting the last um, last plane on the first boulder. And this is what the project looked like when it was done. So they're copper, gold, and silver, um, taking a rather mundane boulder. First, it was this built object and we showed it inside to begin with and it became a built object in the built environment. But then I took them back outside and they're made to be outside. Um, the built object in the natural environment. It, it, you know, the environments that you create, even as what comes above you and below you, I really do see it all uh, speaking to one another. The forms, I do think, speak to one another. And I could see those inside as well as outside. Yeah. Um, in, in environments that you create. Really, really. Uh, well, I'm, I'm continuing to work on this. I think there's a slide. Um, but this was a project I just installed in New Orleans. Um, it's eight feet, it's bronze. And um, I think, wait a minute, I thought I put, no, I didn't put that detail in. Um, and the whole, here was the exercise. Once I came up with the form in this backyard of, of it's basically a, it's a foundation in New Orleans, 
a think tank and this is the backyard, it's in a house. And um, so I wanted to, with my knowledge of 3D modeling, which has gotten pretty, pretty broad, I wanted to not make this model in full scale. So I, everything was delivered to the foundry as a digital model and they brought it from there. So if you think about this, it's a really fun way of thinking, for me, thinking about object making. When I'm making an object by hand from beginning to end, I will build it and build it and build it and build it until it's what I want. Here, I had the foundry make it and I subtracted, subtracted, subtracted till I got what I wanted. <laughs> and what did I subtract? No mass, no, it didn't change the form, but we went in and put millions of pinged um, uh, texture with a uh, air powered needle gun and spent, we could do it, the three of us in the studio, when I was working on it, I had the guys in, we could tolerate two hours a day of the loud work. So over the course <laughs> of a few months, and I also have tenants, so I didn't want to torture them, but we, we textured it and textured it. And then this patina um, was really the, it's, I don't have the foundries do my patina, I do the patinas. Um, because this discovery of the patina is is really, really great. So in it's 2000, a beautiful color. Thank you. 2017, I was introduced to the president, David Yeager of University of the Arts in Philly. And um, I went through the search process and got hired to be the new head of glass at University of the Arts. This is a lithograph from early 18, 1850, it says down there. That's still the main building of the university. And they had a very small glass program. Here's just a blackboard to prove that I was teaching actual how to work with glass. <laughs> um, and uh, so that's a real blackboard from one day. And anybody, I, I had to teach glass blowing. So this is me working with a visiting artist. And here was our cold shop. And in the same room, our stained glass shop. And this was to be our new cold shop. And this was, oh, this is our uh, Abby, one of my postgrads loading the furnace. And this was the hot shop, which when I got there, I was like, oh my God, this place is beat. But as I began to work in it, I fell in love with it, but it was not a hot shop appropriate for teaching in. It was, you couldn't have even a second person blowing and this was gonna be the new hot shop. And if you look up on a balcony, there's a person and they're standing next to what was gonna be a, bo a bottom feed furnace where you could roll a mold underneath and just open a valve and pour a thousand pounds of glass with no big deal, no ladle marks, nothing. And so you wonder, so I was engaged to do all this and then all of a sudden it just wasn't possible. And mainly- So again, let's talk a little bit about then as you have moved forward with these projects. Yeah. And then you took on the project to teach and you can talk a little bit more about that. But I am interested when you took this on and, uh, and of course it's higher education, facility growth, all of those things. But um, I would, I'm interested in your view of this, the new generation, the, the young students that you had and what happened with them being exposed to the glass material. You know, talk about that and a little bit then how you had to guide them, especially as we discussed, because those were the years of COVID. So just talk about you relating your experience to this younger audience and exposing them to this material. What was that like for you? How did the students respond? Those of you who know me and uh, those of you who don't are just getting to know me, I'm a pretty excitable guy. <laughs> and I trot through my excitement of not only being an artist, but of the material. So as I was commuting from Providence, when we were in person, I left Providence Monday night and came back Friday. 
and I had an apartment in Philadelphia. The reason I say that is because there was no family down there. I was in the studio probably like from 8.30 until nine at night. I'd go out for dinner, I'd go out and see friends, but I was always kind of stopping around. The problem was the department through a lot of problems went from 15 students right two years before I got there, I inherited three students. So we were trying to build the program and I got a lot of minors, but it, we were, I was tasked with not only building a new studio, but building, so you build a facility, you build a curriculum and you build a cohort. And after the first year, the first two were done and we were beginning to get students coming for electives and then COVID hit. So that's how that rolled out. In answer to your question about students, I, I had a lot of students that I saw. I, I was seeing between all the classes I taught, um, lecture classes and studio classes, I was seeing like 35 students a week. And what I saw most was the intense struggle to keep everything balanced. Like to be able to make enough money to be at school and to do your work. And uh, it was, and, and um, I don't know, it was, it was an enlightening time for me. I got as much out of being around students as I hope they got out of me. And what, like, for instance, one of the greatest things was as the head of glass, I was the head of the Borowski Prize Committee, which was a yearly prize for a residency. And so our first person was Sarah Bryland. And she's made great gains and is in that world glass now show of Corning's, the one that's running around. Thanks. So I not only got to know her work, I got to know her and Simone Fieser is this crazy. I think she's, I think she's German and she is the most energetic. She came in and you look at that work. Look at that piece. This is just one of her installations. So she comes into the hot shop and I was saying, well, what do you need help? What do you need help? And finally she goes, I don't want your help. I want all the students help is what I want. And so she just, it was great. I, I don't know. I just really, loved all the engagements with visiting artists. And we had Alicia Lomay in during COVID, Preston Singletary. Um, oh, I can't, I think we had, we had Jose Chartier in. I mean, we had a lot of people come through. People were very generous with, um, with visiting artist gigs during COVID. So for me, being around other teachers and being around thinkers, it was incredible. Am I the right person for the academic life? I could do it. I liked it, but it was difficult. All the admin stuff, it's, a, it's, it's really something. And I have a lot of respect for teachers that have spent their life doing it. So I did it for three years. And um, we, the school came to a point where it just didn't make sense to move forward with crafts and material studies. And um, so what they're doing is putting their energy into building sculpture, fine arts, and probably a good idea because as you may or may not know, art schools, especially the small ones are suffering. Yeah. It's, it's a, a, an oddball career path. Dan, can, yes. can you hear me? Excuse yes, me? Yes, we can. Yes. Oh yes, goodness. we can, Trish. I finally got this thing working, but. I just wanted to say a couple things to you, Dan. You have an incredibly beautiful mind, reflecting nature from raindrops to rocks. But beyond that, you also reflect man's greatest ideas through that circle. You know, I've studied in uh, Japan and different places in Asia, and that circle re represents infinity, forever, eternity, and the Asian idea of the circle of life from death to rebirth. And to me, I'm absolutely in love with your circles. That was such a beautiful, beautiful art piece in glass for me. So I just really want to acknowledge you. And I also loved when you were talking about, and I wanted to make a comment, but I couldn't, <laughs> I, this thing wasn't working here, this computer. So, but just the, uh, creating the visiting artist program, how the teachers get something from the artists, the artists get something from each other. 
and what a supportive idea. That's just a brilliant idea. Thank you so much for all your insights oh. and everything beautiful that you've created. Well, I've got the circle of circles about to show you in the other studio. So <laughs> uh, give me two or three more minutes. We're gonna walk in there. Um, okay. So this is just with one of the visiting artists. This is with Simone. And you can see we had people in class, but you can also see that we are outside. Our studio was virtually, it was three walls plus that outside. So it was, it was challenging. This is Fred Call, who I had in for a week. And we palled around every day from eight in the morning till 12 at night, working on his work. It was, and the students could come in and out. It, it, was, it was really fantastic. These, these beautiful crystals that make up amalgamations. And unfortunately in academia, people put wrong programs in annealing kilns. And this was a full day's work, gonzo. <laughs> And this is another mold of, of uh, Fred's. So that's centrifugal casting. You pour the glass into a graphite mold and spin it, and it makes these. Oh, there I am again. And I literally, right after this, it was getting too heavy for the professor. So we put something <laughs> else on the stick. This is Cooper O'Brien, very interesting young artist who was working with these blow molds. So on the left is him stuffing the piece into the mold, the bubble into the mold. And then we literally broke the mold off during while it was hot to reveal. And <clears throat> just some student work. And what I found fascinating, uh, Dan, that you were talking about also that because of COVID, and I want to hear about this uh, because of the Karen Lamont there, um, is that you had to teach uh, students how to blow uh, glass uh, via Zooms, right? No, we did not blow glass remotely, but we did kiln casting process. There you go. Remotely. Yeah. Real, I shifted over to kiln casting processes, worked with the dean to come up with a curriculum that would work. I'm showing this slide because this is a woman named Carly Leeming in ceramics, and she had never seen um, Karen's work. And she was, these are all draped, you know, fiber frax blanket, high temperature blanket. This is fiber frax blanket dipped in porcelain slip. Um, uh -huh. Really amazing work. She's gone on to really, really do well. Here is one of the boxes that went back and forth during COVID. <laughs> so there were two boxes, and this wasn't even the right box, two unbreakable boxes per student. One was always going, one was always coming. And um, they would make their molds, send them to me, and I would fire them. And then this one great student, I said, why did you, Rakaya, why did you put this in this box? Oh, I don't know. I, I didn't want to use your box. So it broke. <laughs> and this was I'm done students. by, this grapefruit is a pot de verre grapefruit done during COVID by a student. Wow. Yep. That's impressive. And this is my faculty of crafts and material studies. Um, no longer, none of us. At, at UArts, everybody's gone on and found themselves. And this is my first group of graduates. And as you notice, I'm not with Sam. This is my second graduate. Um, <laughs> so in progress, we're gonna end here. Yes. Right now I'm working on a federal arts and architecture project um, for the Ashley Federal Courthouse in Toledo, Ohio. And the first iteration of the building, this was my space, not my artwork. During um, 2018, as the steel tariffs came in, the price of steel came up so high domestically that they had to rethink the building and they rethought it. This was what I was gonna do. And the multitude of objects and the just two-sidedness talk about the complexities of the law and there's different ways to look at, thing, at, at things. So you might have a view, you come out on the balcony and you look at another viewpoint. Here is the newly designed um, lobby, very different. And I've been given, mm -hmm. 
I've been given the primo space. So this is just some beginnings. And this is how I'm putting my digital model into it. Love it. And this and, is, and so I've stripped it out of the environment and the piece is called Billow. And it mimics it's... what prairie grass does. If a breeze comes across tall prairie grass and a, a strong breeze and blows it, I have some, I, I have videos and I kind of tracked it and I did not go to the computer and plot it perfectly. It's much more of a poem. The idea is to bring something to the courthouse at this particular courthouse, federal courthouse, you're not there for a good reason. It's absolutely not a fun day. And I just wanted something simple, non-confrontational, but broad. So we've been working on this now, believe it or not, for five years, and it's finally going in next summer. So there's that, oh, there's the patina. Yeah. So That's I'm not gonna show that little video. We're getting a little, a little long, but one of the things I'm working on now is to get a moon rock scanned, and I'm gonna make like I did for, Radiant Land, for, for, the, for the landscape project, I'm gonna take a moon rock, which is only this big, because Apollo didn't have the facility to bring things back this big. And we're gonna take this high res scan and we're gonna blow this up. Why am I doing that? Number one, I was a space nut when I was young. Number two, the Artemis rockets going up into space, which are huge. And they're gonna park somebody around the moon for 40 days and go up and go down. I'm so jazzed by this. But even more, the idea is almost inaccessible. Only a few people have gone and plucked the moon rock and hardly anybody's even held a moon rock. I'm gonna take it and put it out into the world. Okay. And here is a quick computer rendering of one way that that might be made, but I'm not sure. Um, and so this leaves us with the project I just, just in the last month or two brought to its quarter scale model to fruition. Orbital Traces is a project to honor the circle continuity, but it is an engineering, it's gonna be an engineering marvel. Um, <laughs> it's built with a steel frame. So here's the frame drafting. It, that immediately reverts back to my knowledge of rock and roll lighting trusses. So okay. I was able to design this, bring it to the engineer. He hasn't analyzed it yet, but he said, you're on the right track for the weight load. So you go from steel, you bolt the steel together and then bolt the glass on. And I made this quarter scale model with um, 3D printed, parts every which way. Here's all what's going to be glass. And here's the inside truss. Now, what's exciting about this besides this object is once I finally somehow get the real object in glass up in the air at 18 feet in diameter, it opens up all sorts of structures for architectural intervention. Uh, and here's yeah, some cool. putting parts together. Uh, just incredible. I love where your mind goes with all of this, Dan, and it just keeps expanding. And it keeps uh, breaking uh, uh, space uh, in the environments. It's just, uh, you, you are just moving. You continue oh, yeah. to move. You continue to create. It's just fantastic. Just lovely to see all this. Okay. What else do you have? Can you let me in? I just got one more. Can you let me in to... Another Zoom, can somebody, there I am. Let me turn off this. Uh, okay. I hope everyone has been uh, enjoying this presentation. I know we're going a little long with Dan, 
However, uh, we will be wrapping it up. And until he gets the video piece back on, I think that uh, that might be happening. I just want to say a couple of things that uh, next week, we will be uh, on Friday, October 21st. Okay, I see Dan has his video. We'll go with Dan's video. Okay, Dan. Okay. Oh, we got some echo. All right. All right. Rather spacey, spacey, huh? Yeah. yeah. Oh. That's really going to be spectacular. Yeah. These rings. I'm not sure if Dan has turned on the audio. Wow, look at the size, the proportion to the people. Really gorgeous. I'm not sure if Dan knows his audio is on or off. It, it, it is uh, okay. quite okay. spectacular. Okay. I feel he's coming back. I am. Okay. We'll get audio back for Dan. Dan, you want to turn your audio back on? Okay. That should be right. So that's that's where I am. Well, I I also think it's spectacular. And uh, is there anyone that has uh, any questions? I know there was one from Peter Bremers who asked, "Where are the rocks? Where are the the sculpture, the rock sculptures now that you created that were in that natural environment?" Um, they're in the studio. Yes. Hi, Dan. Hi, Peter. How are you doing? Good, good. That was wonderful to see, but I'm, just when you went into your studio, unfortunately, we didn't have any sound. I think you were explaining about the large yeah. circle. Could Can you, you see it? say something about it? Yeah. So I was just, I was, first of all, I just wanted you to see that structure at scale. So yeah. I don't know if you could with the little silhouettes of the people. Um, I am interested in how do you take the circle that I've been working on now for some years and how do we enlarge it, miniaturize it, turn it on its head where that graphic image of the circle still resonates as something meditative maybe, as focus? Mm -hmm but also there's a little bit of the wow factor when it gets that big and wondering how it also, it is the form I've been dealing with and I'm looking on it as a way, a way to experiment with larger forms for architectural intervention. Mm -hmm. um, now, one reason I'm, really interested in this, in, in the um, steel frame and the glass skin, is it can be made in parts. And you know, as well as me, that casting large scale glass <laughs> is a massive pain in the butt. And it, <laughs> and it, it, yes. um, it really, uh, it really, as I began to cast things bigger, it took the fun out of it almost, but I'm not done with this architectural intervention. Does that make sense? Totally. Yeah. So I'm yeah, using my engineering good. expertise and all of that to bring this to fruition. All right. 
Well, I love what you're doing. Just, just your statement that there are different ways to look at things. And then that huge circle could not only be the wow factor, but it could be meditative, just mm -hmm. depending on the viewpoint of who's, who looks at it. Yeah. So I, I love that fabulous viewpoint that you have. So the orbit is, the other thing I'm interested in is how stuff travels through space and how all the space junk is orbiting and all the natural stuff from meteors exploding, exploding. So I've actually taken an amalgamation of stuff, my stuff, and made an orbit. Now it happens to be, for those of us who know of our orbits, orbits tend to be, because of gravitational pull, more elliptical. Mm -hmm. yes. So that is certainly something to be looked at as I move through these ideas. Love that. So the circle changes. Yeah. I love that. So um, do we have any other questions for Dan before we sign off? We're going a little long. And uh, hey, Dan, I, I just have to say thank you again for putting uh, together this presentation, the time you invested in it. I know you were meeting deadlines and and uh, but it's it's been such a pleasure for you joining us today at Imagine Museum. I think that uh, our guests who will hear this on Facebook and uh, on our YouTube channel will really be informed a little bit more about the pieces that they see in this museum that we have of yours. So uh, really just wanna thank you for saying yes. Well, thank when you, and I'm, I'm sorry about the technical glitch as I went to the other, somehow, usually it just comes up, do you wanna switch? Yeah. And yeah. it didn't today, but whatever, you guys got the gestalt of this big thing that I'm working on. Yes, we, we so. certainly did. And I just love this whole evolution of seeing your work and where you have landed and where you're at now. I just uh, couldn't be more supportive of, of what you do and how you're moving it all forward. So thank you Thanks. for being with us today. I'm going to make a, a few last announcements that uh, next week we will be hosting our studio encounter with Duncan McClellan and his gallery, Hatch Up in School. Um, as one of the final acts of our 2022 United Nations Delegated uh, International Year of Glass. If you're uh, interested in more information, go to our website. And also on uh, Saturday, November 12th, that we will be opening a new exhibit in our rotating galleries, and it will be Karen Lamont's Floating World. So please, again, go to our website and... Uh, and look for our email to uh, reserve your spot for that opening. And then, uh, and, and really support of all of our Florida friends and colleagues uh, for the rest of this month that we have reduced our adult ticket price to $12, uh, just to be able to provide you with the opportunity to come to the museum and to have time to reflect, to be inspired, uh, to be uplifted and also just to be educated about these uh, wonderful artists that have been working with this uh, amazing, uh, remarkable material of glass for over the last 60 years. So do you have any last comments for us, Dan, before we sign off? I, well, I just want to say thanks. This, you know, these invitations always get my head thinking, so... Yes, yes. Well, I love that we had the opportunity to catch up. I hope you get down to Florida soon so we can show you how how we uh, display your work, not only the, the spires that are behind me, but the circle that we do have displayed in the gallery. And it does take up, it does really show itself well in the gallery we have it presented to. to Thanks leave. everybody for taking the time today. I yes, really, really yes, appreciate yes. it. Yes, yes. Great talk, Dan. Yes, good, good. Thanks, everybody, and we'll be signing off. Thanks, Dan. Bye-bye.